section twenty three of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty one the third day the next morning the following placard attracted general attention citizens of paris orders have been given to cease firing everywhere we have just been charged by the king to form a new ministry the chamber will be dissolved and an appeal made to the country general la mauriciere has been appointed commandant of the national guard liberty order union reform odillon barreau thiers such was the placard which appeared at every corner in paris on the morning of thursday february twenty fourth at three o'clock it had been hastily struck at the offices of la presse and le constitutionnel and given into the hands of the bill posters at daylight it was read by the early passers and as soon as read indignantly torn down with the significant murmur it is too late at eight o'clock a proclamation to the national guard signed by la mauriciere and countersigned by odillon barreau was similarly received at nine o'clock the forty fifth regiment of the line fraternized with the national guard the thirtieth resigned its arms to the people and the five companies of compierre yielded their quarters with all their arms and ammunition at the first summons at ten o'clock a proclamation was posted up at the bourse signed by odillon barreau and thiers ordering the troops not only to cease firing but to retire to their quarters immediately the trumpets sounded a retreat and the most important positions hitherto held by the line were yielded to the people the men of the barricades could now concentrate and advance magic there was none in the names of barreau and thiers to restrain them both were viewed as deserters from their cause the latter was openly insulted by the populace wherever he appeared and the former though at first respectfully listened to was at length assailed with murmurs of disapprobation on his way to the tuileries in his editorial sanctum sat our friend beauchamp of whom for some time we have lost sight but who has meanwhile been most industriously at work in his paper le charivari in concert with le national and other larger sheets in forwarding the cause of reform and finally of revolution the door opened and chateau renaud appeared farewell beauchamp he exclaimed i have not a moment to lose a post-chaise is at the door farewell off cried the journalist in astonishment and whither and why yes off for england italy america anywhere but france exclaimed the young noble and why why cried the indignant deputy look around you and then ask what there is left in france for me beauchamp continued the young man hurriedly and in low tones france will have no king at this hour to-morrow mark the prophecy the national guard fraternizes with the populace the line fraternizes with the guard the government is of course paralyzed all is over six hours hence the tuileries will be ransacked by a drunken mob farewell one moment why do you leave in this way why do you not go to bologna by the cars and do you not know you a journalist that for three leagues around in every direction every railway radiating from paris has been torn up do you not know that every public conveyance even to the mail diligences has been stopped and that all the telegraph stations have been dismantled all to prevent the further concentration of troops in paris by the government i did hear of this indeed said beauchamp at dawn i was at the railway depot having late last night with extreme difficulty procured a passport and whom think you among crowds of others i encountered there you would never guess and i haven't time for you to try lucien de bray and with him but that's impossible for you to divine she who was madame danglars 
wife of the rich banker years ago well the banker is dead and she is immensely rich and i suppose lucien's spouse into the bargain and where go they oh to england of course that grand reservoir of all emigrant royalists that asylum for all who love kings but farewell farewell if i am not off soon i may have to go without my head and if you are not massacred by your detestable party i hope to hear of you yet as a cabinet minister despite your abominable principles you have my best wishes farewell and with a hearty shake of beauchamp's hand the young noble was off for an atmosphere more congenial to monarchists than was that of paris nor was he alone thousands fled from paris in like manner that same day and the only cry that followed them was this let them go let them go the streets of paris were now choked with barricades not the mere temporary breastworks of the first and second days which a single charge of heavy dragoons would sweep away but regular systematic scientific structures erected apparently under the direction of military engineers and calculated upon every principle of art to ensure resistance some of them were of immense size that for example at the corner of the rue richelieu some had portholes from which protruded the mouths of ordnance in battery all were surmounted by a flag tricolor or red and all were defended by desperate men some other thoroughfares were crossed by many barricades the rue de saint martin for instance by thirty or forty the troops assailing these structures were mowed down throughout the day in a manner which even their opponents deemed most merciless instances of individual bravery on both sides were frequent in the rue mauconcier a young man exposed himself on the top of the barricade time after time firing with fatal aim and every time a shower of balls from the troops assailing whistled around him but he stood untouched and at length the officer ordering the troops to fire at him no more he retired at once behind the breastwork a boy in the rue de saint honore mounted the barricade enveloped in a tricolor flag and dared the troops to fire on their colors he descended unharmed an officer of the line was summoned to yield his sword he did so but first broke it in twain across his knee the same demand was made to a lieutenant of the municipal guard with a musket at his breast he was bidden also to shout vive la république but he only cried vive le roi as the weapon was wrenched from his grasp yet he was spared arms were demanded from every householder and when given the gift was endorsed on the door in these words here we were given arms one man received a sword splendidly decorated with gems upon its scabbard and hilt i want only the blade he said tearing it away from its ornaments and grasping the naked steel at ten o'clock m odillon barreau general la Mauricière, and horace vernet the great marine artist proceeded on horseback to the barricades to induce the people to disperse but all their eloquent entreaties were received only with insults no truce no tricks no mistake this time were the decisive shouts with which they were greeted a second time in the rue richelieu general lamoricière accompanied by moline saint gru bearing a palm branch was equally unsuccessful it is too late was the terrible response from the heart of the barricades followed by a shower of stones one of which wounded general lamoricière on the hand a third time in the rue rohan general gourgaud who even promised the abdication of the king met with the same utter defeat and hastily fled from the fury of the monster now thoroughly roused at twelve o'clock the rumour sped with lightning rapidity through the streets of paris that the troops who had ostensibly been ordered to their quarters were in fact concentrated around the palace instantly rose the shout to the tuileries to the tuileries and a hundred thousand men from all sections of the city marched toward the palais bourbon and the tuileries 
the rumour of the concentration at the palace was true the place de carrousel was crowded with troops of every arm including several squadrons of cuirassiers and six pieces of ordnance were in position with their ammunition caissons and their provisions and baggage wagons as if for a siege the king attended by his staff and accompanied by the dukes of nemours and montpensier now descended into the court to pass the troops in review the line shouted vive le roi as the king rode along the national guards with tones and looks of menace and defiance cried reform the king replied yes my friends you shall have reform and sad and dispirited turned away to his apartments as he retired the bitter murmur was heard from his aged lips like charles dix a deputation of the people had been admitted within the limits of the place du carrousel to announce the terms they would accept but after a brief parley had retired dissatisfied the men of the barricades now invested the Tuileries and the palais royal on every side such was the scene without within all was confusion and dismay the salon were thronged by deputies peers generals and marshals bougot la Mauricière, du pain thiers de l'asterie and many others were there together with all of the royal family then in the capital whether male or female meanwhile the rattle of musketry broken by the occasional roar of ordnance in the direction of the palais royal indicated the severe struggle then going on between the people and the troops from time to time the furious shout of to the guillotine with louis philippe reached the ear does your majesty hear that asked the duke of nemours coldly of his dismayed father alas the old man was no longer the hero of july third i do my son was the trembling reply do you advise abdication is there any other course left asked the duke of montpensier any other course cried the queen indignantly oh are you my son are you a son of orleans and can you talk thus of degradation are you a soldier and do you fear mount mount charge on the rebels cut them to the earth drench the pavement with their blood perish but yield not ignominiously thus madame said m thiers solemnly it is too late there must be an abdication in favour of the count of paris and the appointment of the duchess of orleans as regent or all is lost then if this must be let it be done with dignity becoming a monarch said the noble queen let us all retire to st cloud there may be dictated terms of honourable capitulation there at that instant in rushed a man breathless bearing a sheet of paper in his hand and exclaiming sire sire your troops are delivering their arms to the people in a moment they will stand where you now stand sign this paper or your life and the lives of all your family will be sacrificed that man was emile de girardin the editor of la presse and the murderer of armand carrel and that paper was an act of abdication ah this is a bitter cup said the old king as he placed his signature to the sheet and doubly bitter presented by such a hand like charles dix at one o'clock at the bourse and at the corners of all the principal streets was posted this proclamation citizens of paris the king has abdicated in favour of the count of paris with the duchess of orleans as regent a general amnesty dissolution of the chamber appeal to the country but the people were now in the midst of the assault on the palais royal and to check them was impossible the palais royal consisted of two portions the chateau d'eau or palace and the other part which though the property of the orleans family was yet rented by private persons and was occupied for cafes shops dwellings and places of entertainment adorned by colonnades and arcades and by trees statues and fountains in the magnificent quadrangle the property of the citizens was respected that of the king only was assailed for two hours did the fourteenth regiment pour forth its fire from the numerous windows of that edifice and from the court below 
at length a band of bold republicans headed by the chivalric etienne arago musket in hand charged from the side of the cafe de la regence followed by a detachment of the national guard and driving the troops into the building surrounded it with straw which they set on fire the vast edifice was instantly filled with smoke and flame the defence ceased the soldiers rushed out and were instantly slain the commander of the detachment was pierced by a bayonet the multitude rushed in and the building was sacked the richest and most costly furniture and decorations were at once torn down dashed to pieces and thrown from the windows by the infuriated populace within the palace of the tuileries is a subterranean passage constructed for the infant king of rome and his nurses which plunging beneath the pavements and passing along the whole length of the gardens under the terrace beside the river bank suddenly emerges at the gate of the place du carrousel in front of the obelisk into this passage in wild panic descended the king and queen of france with all their children and grandchildren immediately upon the signing of the abdication and just as the doors were about to be forced emerging from the passage the king leaning on the arm of his faithful wife marie amelie and followed by the royal party crossed the place de la concorde as far as the asphalt pavement the royal party now consisted of the king and queen the duchess of nemours and her children the princess clementine and her husband the duke of augustus of saxe coburg and the duke of montpensier with his young and lovely spanish bride now enceinte and far advanced ignorant of the language only sixteen years of age a stranger to the customs and people of the country and in her delicate situation the position of this young creature was peculiarly trying at one moment she clung with terror to her young husband's arm which she refused for an instant to resign and the next laughed at her own terror saying that one who in her infancy had twice in madrid been saved by being carried off in a sack ought not now to fear when she had feet to carry herself away and was suffered to use them it is said that the fair signora was forgotten in the hurry of the flight and almost left behind as soon as the royal party were perceived they were surrounded by a troop of national guards as an escort and a large number of officers of the line in various uniforms the king leaned on the queen as if for support while she boldly advanced with a firm step and stern look both were in deepest mourning for the recent death of the beloved sister of the king the princess adelaide upon this melancholy procession the people gazed with mingled curiosity amusement gratification and regret they are going to the chamber of deputies to complete the abdication cries one vive la réforme shouts another vive la france shouts a second vive la roi in suppressed tones falters a third see the poor young duchess cried a woman who was availing herself of her peculiar rotundity as a battering ram to force her way through the crowds she had better have remained at home sneered a dynastic bitterly the poor little children exclaimed a young woman more remarkable for prettiness than neatness and more remarkable still for the scantiness of her attire nearly all of which had been torn from her rounded shoulders in the throng the spirit which pervaded the mass was evidently by no means unfriendly to the royal family and it was as evidently misunderstood by them for suddenly as if by fatality on the very spot where louis the sixteenth was beheaded just beyond the pont tournant on the pavement of the obelisk of luxor the whole party with no apparent necessity came to a dead and complete halt instantly the multitude was crowded upon them and this augmented their terror the king dropped the queen's arm and hastily raising his hat cried vive la réforme all was in a moment uproar and confusion the queen in terror at finding her husband's arm was gone turned hurriedly on every side fear not madame said a mild voice beside her the people will do you no harm this was m maurice editor of la courrier des spectacles 
leave me leave me monsieur she exclaimed in great excitement evidently mistaking the words then regaining her husband she again grasped his arm and the mass at the same time opening its ranks the two hastened on to a couple of those little black one-horse vehicles chancing there to stand which run to st cloud in one of these already sat the duchesses of montpensier and nemours with two of the children in the other stood the two remaining children into the latter hurriedly stepped the royal pair the door was instantly closed and the vehicle drove off at a furious rate surrounded by an escort of dragoons cuirassiers and national guards two hundred in number taking the water side towards st cloud the other carriage similarly escorted followed at a like rapid pace the children standing at the windows their faces pressed to the glass gazing eagerly with the innocent curiosity of infancy on a scene from which their future fate would take shape he is gone shouted a stentorian voice breaking the momentary stillness as the carriages surrounded by their escort swept from the view let him go let him go was the stern and significant response we are not regicides to the tuileries to the tuileries was now the tremendous shout which rose from the multitude as they rushed toward the deserted palace but the tuileries had already fallen it was no longer the dwelling-place of kings even before the royal abdication was declared even before it was signed the troops of the line in the courtyard of the palace infantry artillery dragoons to the number at least of twenty-five thousand were summoned to surrender their posts while the fraternal shout vive la ligne elicited from the lips of many of the soldiers the answering cry of vive la reforme in vain was it that marshal bougeot the veteran of a hundred battles menaced and blasphemed in vain did his old protege and subaltern but now bitter foe general la Mauricière, dashing from one end of the line to the other on his white horse entreat and persuade with his eloquent tongue the people insisted the national guard fraternized the line wavered and yet most imminent at that moment was their own peril the first second third fourth sixth and tenth legions of the national guard invested the tuileries and others were on the march accompanied by countless masses of the people within the courtyard were twenty-five thousand of the best troops in the world of every arm and a park of ordnance charged to the muzzle frowned upon the dense masses which swarmed the place du carrousel the watchful artilleryman stood at his cannon's breech with the lighted linstock in his hand which he kept alive by constant motion he awaited but a word from the pale firm lips of general la Mauricière, and that vast and magnificent space now swarming with life would have been swept as if by destruction's besom death in all its most horrid forms would have been there that pavement would have run with gore the facades of those splendid edifices would have been polluted with shreds and fragments of human flesh and spattered with human blood yet dreadful would have been the sure retribution indiscriminate massacre of all unfortunate souls within that royal palace would have been inevitable and instantaneous yet such a catastrophe might be precipitated by a single word the avalanche might be started by a single breath and blood once shed paris would be deluged in the name of the people i demand to speak with the commandant of the tuileries shouted a young man in the uniform of an officer of the national guard advancing to the iron railing of the court near the rue de rivoli it was lieutenant aubert roche the commandant was sent for and immediately arrived monsieur you are lost cried the young man you are surrounded by sixty thousand men of the national guard and one hundred thousand of the people of paris what is demanded was the trembling response that you evacuate the tuileries resign it to the national guard the troops shall be withdrawn monsieur orders for their retirement to the palace shall be issued instantly that will not do the palace must be evacuated insisted the lieutenant or the people will raise it to the ground come with me monsieur said the commandant the gate was immediately opened and lieutenant roche accompanied by monsieur le sieur chef 
de bataillon bearing a flag of truce followed the commandant to the pavillon de l'horloge where stood the duke of nemours pale with excitement surrounded by generals monseigneur said the commandant suffer me to present a deputation from the people monsieur what do the people demand asked the duke in trembling tones the evacuation this instant of this palace and its delivery to the national guard and if we do not comply asked marshal bougeot calmly then monsieur you are all lost was the bold answer this palace is surrounded by one hundred and sixty thousand men the combat once begun must be exterminating must be a massacre the fifth legion of the national guard to which i belong is at this moment sacking the palais royal it may be here before we part the troops shall retire monsieur said the duke and on the instant orders for the retreat were issued the artillery went by the railing of the palace and the staff and the duke of nemours by the pavillon de l'horloge their well-trained horses descending the flight of steps the cavalry followed succeeded by the infantry the national guards were then introduced by lieutenant roche and entered the court of the tuileries by the gate of the rue de rivoli their muskets shouldered with the stock in the air at the same moment the abdication of the king was declared general lamoricier had resigned the ministry was dissolved there was a tremendous shout and the conquerors of the palais royal rushed in to take possession of the tuileries end of section twenty three section twenty four of edmond dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmond dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty two the last session of the chamber of deputies the usual hour for the opening of the chamber of deputies was three o'clock but the startling events of the last two days and especially of the last two hours demanded that it should be convened earlier at one o'clock the president of the chamber sauze took the chair on the left bank of the seine all the approaches were open save the bridges of the place de la concorde where strong detachments of cavalry were posted on guard within the chamber all was solemnity about three hundred members were present the opposition seemed joyous and confident though anxious the conservative party was troubled the ministerial benches were deserted at half-past one the president turned round in his chair and kept his eye fixed upon a side door as if expecting some one to enter suddenly a bustle was heard in that direction and the duchess of orleans in deep mourning attended by her two sons and followed by the dukes of montpensier and nemours entered the latter was received with marked expressions of dislike the count of paris garbed in complete black was conducted through the crowd to the space in front of the president's chair the duchess followed and seated herself in a fauteuil upon the same spot on each side of her was one of her sons and behind her stood her brothers the dukes of nemours and montpensier this position was subsequently changed for one more distant but otherwise remained throughout relatively the same being seated the duchess rose and bowed repeatedly to the assembly at the same moment an immense multitude of national guards and the people rushed in through the passages and despite the shouts of the officers you cannot enter the space beneath the tribune was instantly and densely thronged at the same time the public tribunes were invaded by a second body of the people for some minutes the greatest uproar prevailed at length it comparatively ceased and in a moment of quiet m dupin who had accompanied the duchess of orleans to the chamber ascended the tribune the stillness was instantly as great as had been the previous agitation the king has abdicated said m dupin the count of paris is nominated as his successor and the duchess of orleans as regent 
it is too late shouted a man from the gallery of the people the count of paris is proclaimed king by the chamber and the duchess of orleans regent exclaimed the president no 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 was the almost unanimous shout that now rose in the chamber i demand cried m lamartine that the royal family withdraw the question was put and the duchess and her sons after great hesitation were drawn away to a side door at the further end of the hall at the same moment a new crowd of the people rushed in and took seats beside the opposition members by whom they were welcomed i demand to speak cried m marie by the law of eighteen forty two the duke of nemours is regent how can the king abrogate that law i demand a provisional government a provisional government cried m cremieux we made a mistake in thirty let there be no mistake in forty eight a provisional government said the abbe genoude a legitimist but it must be the will of the people m odillon barreau who had been long expected now entered and immediately mounted the tribune the crown of july rests on the head of a woman and a child cried the great lawyer the duchess of orleans instantly rose as if about to speak but at the urgent solicitation of those around her resumed her seat i call on the country to rally around this woman and this child cried m barreau the twofold representative of the principles of july thirty the voice of the speaker was drowned in shouts of dissent and of vive la reforme i dissent from the opinion of m odillon barreau cried the marquis de la roche jacquelin if he is right the people are nothing order order cried the president putting on his hat but he was at once induced to remove it at this moment another vast crowd burst into the chamber garbed in a style so heterogeneous as to be grotesque some with blouses some with dragoon helmets on their heads some with weapons and many with flags down 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 with the throne was the terrible cry of this infuriated mass i demand that the sitting be suspended cried m de mornay there can be no session at such a moment said the president putting on his hat off 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 with your hat president cried the populace and several of their muskets were at once pointed at the president the hat was removed the scene was chaos beware shouted m chevalier editor of the historical library beware how you make the count of paris king a provisional government we must first have what right have you to speak shouted a man you are not a deputy in the name of the people silence roared a terrific voice that drowned every other it was the voice of ledru rollin many of the deputies now withdrew and their places were filled by the people the duchess of orleans sat calmly amid the uproar and the duke of nemours with equal calmness stood behind her chair the throne has been tumbled from the windows of the tuileries and is now burning in the place de la bastille cried m du moulin who commanded the hotel de ville in july of thirty displaying the tricolor flag no more bourbons down with the bourbons down with the traitors a provisional government shouted the people ay a republic cried m chevalier cremieux ledru rollin and lamartine were at the same time in the tribune in the name of the people silence again roared the awful voice of ledru rollin a provisional government shouted one of the people you shall have a provisional government exclaimed m maguin in the name of the people in the name of the people of paris in arms again began ledru rollin i protest against this king and this regency the constitution of nine demands the will of the people to fix a regency yet the law of forty two makes the duke of nemours regent and now it is the duchess of orleans i protest against it all i demand a provisional government question question shouted m berrier a provisional government in eighteen fifteen continued ledru rollin napoleon abdicated in favor of the king of rome the king of rome was refused in eighteen thirty charles the tenth abdicated in favor of his grandson the grandson was rejected in eighteen forty eight louis philippe abdicates in favor of his grandson the count of paris question question again vociferated 
monsieur berrier we all know those histories in the name of the people continued ledru rollin i demand a provisional government named by the people not by the chamber but by the people tremendous shouts followed and m le martin who had stood beside rollin in the tribune now took his place amid renewed shouts after an eloquent speech on the same side as his friend he concluded by demanding a provisional government with an appeal to the people the entire people all who by the title of man have rights as men while lamartine was yet speaking a violent knocking was heard at the door of the chamber which was forcibly burst open and a vast crowd rushed in down with the chamber down with the deputies shouted the populace and muskets were instantly levelled at lamartine and also at the royal party it is lamartine it is lamartine was the cry of terror that rose from his friends the muskets were lowered the duchess and her party were at once withdrawn from the chamber by a side door and having first retired to the hotel des invalides next fled to the rhine the duke of nemours fled to boulogne and thence to england silence 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 shouted the president violently ringing his bell but the uproar only increased i pronounce this session closed cried the president and putting on his hat he instantly left the chair Here, ends the chamber of deputies a large number of the members withdrew with the president but the opposition remained and with them the people and the national guards after the noise incident to this departure had subsided the venerable m dupont de lure a gray-headed old man of eighty was by unanimous acclamation placed in the president's chair lamartine still remained in the tribune and repeatedly strove to make his voice heard but in vain in the name of the people silence and let lamartine speak at length was heard in the thunder tones of ledru rollin rising above all other sounds silence for a moment being obtained lamartine exclaimed citizens a provisional government is declared the names of the members will now be announced by the president lamartine then descended from the tribune applause and uproar succeeded the names of the members nominated for a provisional government i will now read to you said the aged president rising and displaying a paper the following names were then read and were repeated as they came one after the other from the speaker's mouth by the reporters in loud tones lamartine ledru rollin arago dupont de lure marie georges lafayette all were received with general approbation the members of the provisional government must be conducted by the people to the hotel de ville and installed cried a voice from the crowd let us adjourn to the hotel de ville lamartine at the head said m bocage immediately lamartine accompanied by a large number of citizens withdrew but a great multitude still remained upon the benches and in the semicircle of the chamber citizens cried ledru lorelin in nominating a provisional government you perform a solemn act an act which cannot be performed in a furious manner let me once more repeat to you the names you have chosen and as they are repeated you will say yes or no precisely as they please you i call on the reporters of the public press to note the names and the manner in which they are now received that france may know what is here done the names of dupont de lure arago lamartine ledru rollin cremieux garnier page and marie were then read out and all except the last two which were received with a few negatives were confirmed by unanimous acclamation the names were then engrossed in capitals on a sheet of paper and borne around the chamber on the bayonet of a national guard that all might read for themselves i have one more word to say cried ledru rollin the provisional government has immense duties to perform we must now close this meeting that the government may be able to restore order stanch the flow of blood and secure to the people their rights to the hotel de ville to the hotel de ville responded the people in a tremendous shout viva la république to the hotel de ville headed by ledru rollin the excited multitude withdrew and at four o'clock all was as silent in the chamber of deputies as if not a voice had resounded or a footstep had echoed within its walls for centuries in the distance however could be heard the repeated shout viva la république to the 
hotel de ville end of section twenty four section twenty five of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty three the sack of the tuileries scarcely had the carriages conveying the royal family disappeared on their flight towards st cloud when the whole mass of the populace poured as with one simultaneous purpose into the deserted palace the palais bourbon had already been sacked a like fate might be supposed to await the tuileries but the tuileries belonged to france not to the house of orleans and a certain respect was observed for everything but the insignia of royalty for these was shown no regard the throne itself of the state reception-room that throne on which sat louis philippe for the first time as king of the french ere the tuileries became his throne was torn from its base and having been hurled first in derision from the windows into the court was borne in mock triumph on the shoulders of men who shouted that now the throne was indeed supported by the people to the place de la bastille and there consumed to ashes in the courtyard in the rue de rivoli and on the quays huge fires roared fanned into fury by a hurricane of wind and fed by richly carved furniture gilded chairs canopies pianos sofas beds costly paintings splendid works of art and the royal carriages glittering with gold the magnificent tapestries of the gobelins were borne as streamers in frantic fury along the boulevards the mischievous gamins were frolicking about in the long scarlet robes worn upon court occasions which they had filched from the royal wardrobe the esquitoire of the king the key having been found in a teacup was ransacked and private letters books and the garments of ladies were strewn about the court and gardens of the tuileries the cellars of the palace were soon filled with the insurgents but they declared the wine bad as it never remained long enough in the cellars of kings to get good destruction not pillage seemed the order of the hour and to guard against robbery the people took upon themselves the arrest and punishment of offenders the walls bore the menace robbers shall die in several instances the threat was carried into immediate execution and bodies suffered to lie on the spot upon which they had been cut down bore on their breasts the label thief in terrible warning sentinels also stood at the gates and no one was allowed to leave the palace without rigorous search in the apartments of the duchess of orleans the table was found spread for the dinner of herself and her children upon the table were the little silver cups forks and spoons of the young princes and on the floor were scattered their costly toys the latter were gathered carefully up by a workman in a blouse and as carefully concealed in a corner the former together with all jewels and other valuables found in the apartments of the duchess were deposited in a bathing tub on which a workman seated himself as guard and suffered no one to approach until the aforesaid valuables could be conveyed by a detachment of the polytechnic school to the government treasury the story runs that on the night succeeding the sack of the tuileries the conquerors chose a king and queen and that in the palace hall was spread a banquet composed of the viands found in the royal kitchen and the wines found in the royal cellars the queen who was a soubrette more noticeable for beauty than for cleanliness of person garbed in royal robes which she well became and with a coronet upon her stately brow was seated in a chair of state and received the most extravagant homage from her willing subjects while groups of gamins in the long crimson liveries of the royal household boisterously frolicked before the saint culat court amid roars of merriment End of section twenty five Section 26 of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Castleberry, Detroit, Michigan, LarryCastleberry.com. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 24, A Memorable Night. Generally, the rogues throughout Paris, intimidated by the awful, immediate, and certain penalty for crime, forsook for the time their calling. A man who attempted to fire the Palais Royale was shot at the prefecture. Another, for a like attempt on buildings in the Rue Monceau, made a like fate. In the Rue Chalou lay the bodies of two thieves, each with a ball through the breast, and over the aperture the word thief on a label. In like manner were eight more robbers, executed at once on the Place de Medellin. A woman of the street wrested a bracelet from a lady's wrist. She was instantly seized by the bystanders and shot. But for the summary punishment of malefactors by the people, dreadful that night would have been the state of Paris, without laws to enforce or a police to enforce them. It is true the Chateau of Neuilly was sacked and burned, as well as the splendid villa of the Baron Rothschild at Perennes, but both were supposed to be the property of the king. It is true also that some rails on the northern railway were torn up, in a viaduct between Paris and Amiens, and another between Amiens and the frontier of Belgium were demolished, and that the railway station at saint denis en guienne and Pontéis and the bridge at Asnières had been destroyed. But all this was done to prevent the concentration upon the citizens of Paris of additional royal troops. A workman entered a house and demanded bread. Meat and wine were offered him. No was the reply. Bread and water are all I want. Yet such was the scarcity of food that horses were killed and eaten at the Hotel de Villa on the third day of the revolution. Arms! Arms! shouted a band of workmen, entering a house on the Richelieu. The proprietor, alarmed, shouted for help. Do you think us robbers? was the indignant reply. Give us your weapons. The weapons were given and the band retired. On the door they wrote, Here we received arms. At five o'clock on the evening of the 24th of February, a proclamation to the citizens of Paris issued by the provisional government, then in session at the Hotel de Villa, declared the revolution accomplished that 80,000 of the National Guard and 100,000 of the people were in arms, that order as well as liberty must now be secured, and the people with the National Guard were appointed guardians of Paris. The effect of this proclamation was magical. Never was Paris so well protected as on that night of the 24th of February, when, filled with barricades, she had no police and was guarded by her citizens. And how was constituted the provisional government? whose power was thus implicitly obeyed? It was founded by the people who obeyed it. This was the only secret. From the Chamber of Deputies to the Hotel de Villa proceeded the members of the provisional government. They marched under a canopy of sabers, pikes, and bayonets into halls stained with blood and encumbered with the slain. And there, at a small table, while the conflict between the two republics had already commenced, Within an hour had they organized their body by the nomination of Armand Maras of the Nationale, Ferdinand Flocon of La Reforme, Albert, a workman, and Louise Blanc, the editor and author, as secretaries of the government. Their first official act was to issue a proclamation to the people. The scenes witnessed the night which succeeded in Paris would never be forgotten by those who witnessed them. Patrols promenaded the streets. The men of the barricades slept upon their weapons, beside their works, and through all that night ceaselessly toiled the press to spread over all the world the news of the great events of the three past days in Paris. Upon the door of an edifice situated in the Rue Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a street which was filled with barricades of immense size and strength, was posted a printed placard. The provisional government, lighted by a single lamp, entering the door with a vast multitude, in ascending the dark and winding staircase, you found yourself in a large room, dimly lighted and crowded with armed men. It was the editorial apartment of the office of Les Reformes. At a large and massive table sat a dozen persons most industriously employed in writing. Around them, looking on, rose the rough, stern faces of the men of the barricades, seeming still more rough and stern by reason of the shadowy light, and the hands of all were weapons. 
A copy of the name of the members of the provisional government was the incessant demand of these armed men, a demand which the dozen writers at the table were unable, even by most indefatigable industry, to supply as fast as made. And as fast as the demand was satisfied, the armed men would hurry away, only to leave the room for the crowds constantly entering. A copy for the Hotel de Villa, cried one. A copy for the Place Bendome, shouted another. A copy for the Palais Bourbon, screamed a third. Are there no printed copies left? asked many. They were gone long ago. Twenty thousand copies, was the reply. You will see one at every corner. The demand was not expected. The printers have just gone to sleep. They had not rested for fifty-two hours. Will our reforme appear in the morning? asked another. Perhaps so, was the answer. But all the people are worn out, writers and compositors. Here is your copy of the names. Many thanks. Vive la République. With this shout, in concert with the same which constantly issued from a hundred lips, the citizens folded up his precious document and carefully depositing it in his cap, hurried off to communicate its contents to his comrades of the neighboring barricade. In another apartment of that same edifice were a large number of the Republican Party connected with Les Reformes. The provisional government is now in session, said one. They will doubtless make immediate provision for departments of states so important as the post office and the prefecture of police. Early tomorrow, a proclamation, tomorrow may be too late, interrupted a large and muscular man. The post office is more active than ever tonight. Every moment, couriers are arriving and departing. That powerful instrument remains in the hands of the foes of our cause. Who may estimate the injury? the irreparable injury which they made this night accomplish by its means. This man was Atien Arago, brother of the great astronomer, and for 16 years celebrated as one of the boldest members of the Republican Party, as well as one of the bravest men in Paris. In the prefecture of police, observed another, the present utter derangement of all its functions may lead to most serious results. Already those foes of freedom, Gazette and his colleagues, have been suffered to secure their escape from the just indignation of an outraged people. De la Cert, the prefect, has also fled. The man who said this was Marc Cassidier, a well-known Republican. Citizens, cried Monsieur Guachi, this state of things must continue no longer. In the name of the people, I demand that Atian Arago immediately assume the charge of the post office as its director and that Marc Cassidier fill the position of prefect. This demand was confirmed by acclamation, and committees for the installation of the nominees into office at once accompanied them to their respective departments. The immense edifice of the post office was surrounded by people, and its numerous windows were flashing with lights. Within the utmost activity seemed to prevail, and without couriers were leaving and arriving every moment, and mail coaches were dashing up to discharge their burdens, or, having received them, were dashing off. In the name of the people, entrance for citizen Etienne Arago, Republican director of the post office, shouted one of the committee. Instantly, a passage through the immense crowd in the courtyard was cleared by the National Guard, and the director entered with his escort. In the name of the people, citizen Dijon, you are dismissed, said Etienne Arago, entering the private cabinet of the director general. And who is to be my successor, said the astonished count rising to his feet. In the name of the people, I am sent to displace and to succeed you, was the answer. But your commission, monsieur, is here, pointing to the committee. Before I resign the direction of this department, said the count after some hesitation, I must ask of you for some record of this act, bearing your signature to be deposited in the archives of the office. Certainly, monsieur, your request is but reasonable, answered Arago, seating himself in the official chair and writing a few lines to which he affixed his signature. He coolly handed the document to his astonished predecessor. It contained notice of his own appointment by the people in place of the Count de Jean, dismiss. The Count read and folded the paper, and having made a copy of it, which he laid carefully in his porte manier, he placed the original on file among the papers of the day belonging to the department. Then, courteously bowing, he took his hat and cane and marched out of the building. End of section 26.
Recording by Larry Castleberry, Detroit, Michigan. LarryCastleberry.com Section 27 of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 25 The Provisional Government. In the Hotel de Ville, closely closeted, sat the Provisional Government of France over that stern old citadel over the dismantled palace of the tuileries from the tall summit of the column of vendome over the hotel des invalides and in the place de la bastille is seen a blood-red banner streaming out like a meteor on the keen northwestern blast eighty thousand armed men invest the hotel de ville and wave on wave wave on wave the living and stormy tide eddies and welters and dashes around that dark old pile all its avenues are held its courts are thronged ordnance frowns from its black portals and against its gates drums roll banners stream bayonets glitter and from those tens of thousands of hoarse and stormy voices goes up but one shout of menace and command viva la république viva la république no kings no bourbons down down for ever with the kings and upward to that dark old pile of despotism as to the temple of liberty herself are turned those tens of thousands of swarthy faces dark with the smoke of battle yet livid with excitement and exhaustion and as they realize that within those walls the question of their fate and that of their country is then being settled that from that night's councils in that vast and ancient edifice are to flow peace and prosperity and freedom and plenty or else all the untold terrors of anarchy civil war bloodshed violence and strife what wonder that the sitting of the council seemed endless and their own impatience became intolerable that all imaginable doubts and fears and absurd apprehensions took possession of their inflamed imaginations that at one time the rumour should fly and when credence as it flew that the provisional government were consulting with the friends of henry v or again that they were considering the question of a regency and that under such influences they should roar and yell and thunder for admission at the gates and burden the air with their shouts no bourbon no kings no regency death death to all kings la république la république la république at times in terrific concert would the thousands of uplifted throats roar forth the chorus of that startling canticle of ninety two vive la république vive la république debout peuple francais debout peuple héorique debout peuple francais vive la république then the song would change and the mournful notes of the death hymn of the girondin mourir pour la patrie would swell in wild yet solemn cadence on the wintry blast death hymn of the girondin by the voice of the signal cannon france calls her sons their aid to lend let us go the soldier cries to battle tis our mother we defend to die on freedom's altar to die on freedom's altar tis the noblest of fates who to meet it would falter we who fall afar from the battle lone and unknown obscurely die but give at least our parting blessings unto france and freedom high to die on freedom's altar to die on freedom's altar tis the noblest of fates who to meet it would falter 
and thus all that terrible night even until the morning's dawn thronged those men of the barricades around the hotel de ville and all the night even until the morning's dawn calmly continued those men of the provisional government of the french republic amid menace and mandate uproar and confusion in their noble yet arduous work at midnight a proclamation of the provisional government was read by torchlight to the excited masses by louis blanc from the steps of the hotel de ville declaring for a government of the people by itself with liberty equality and fraternity for its principles while order was devised and maintained by the people which served somewhat to allay their apprehensions and distrust this proclamation appeared in all the morning journals and was placarded all over the city the next day that day was friday the twenty fifth of february but still the provisional government remained in session and still the armed masses of the barricades in congregated thousands rolled in tumultuous billows around the hotel de ville at length the populace exasperated by impatience hunger and sleeplessness with brandished bayonets rushed into the very chamber of council with furious cries and with threats which were well nigh accomplished again and again at the entreaty of his colleagues did the brave the eloquent the wise lamartine present himself upon the steps of the hotel de ville to assuage and quiet the rising tempest again and again throughout that fearful day did he come forth single-handed to wrestle with violence turbulence anarchy and strife and again and again beneath the magic of his eloquent tongue the storm lulled the tempest ceased again and again throughout all that fearful day were the acts of that noble government matured and sent forth proclamation followed proclamation and no branch of society seemed forgotten the names of the members of the provisional government were again published Cossidiere and sobrier were confirmed in the police department and etienne arago in that of the post office merchants of provisions were recommended to supply all who were in need and the people were recommended to still retain their arms the chamber of deputies was dissolved the peers were forbidden to meet and the convocation of a national assembly was promised to all labourers labour was guaranteed and compensation for labour at noon the garrison of the fort of vincennes was announced to have acknowledged the republic just as the people were about to march upon it to ensure order and tranquillity the municipal guard was disbanded and the national guard entrusted with the protection of paris under m courtet the commandant who was ordered immediately to recruit twenty-four battalions for active service all articles pledged at the mont de piete from february fourth not exceeding in value ten francs were ordered to be returned and the tuileries was decreed the future asylum of invalid workmen an attack on the machinery of some of the printing offices was checked by a proclamation general bedeau was appointed minister of war general cavaignac governor of algeria and admiral baudin to the command of the toulon fleet on the part of the army marshal bougeot and on the part of the clergy the venerable archbishop of paris gave in their adhesion to the republic while the entire press bourgeoisie and the province hesitated not an instant indeed from all quarters came in adhesions to the republic the bonapartes were among the first barreau and thiers also came but too late to save themselves from contempt mr rush the american minister the first of foreign ambassadors acknowledged the republic the son of mehemet ali was next the papal nuncio succeeded together with the ministers of the argentine republic and uruguay next came the ambassador of england but those of austria prussia russia and holland awaited instructions from home 
little dreaming of the news they were about to receive the city of rouen sent three hundred of its citizens as a deputation with abundant supplies of arms by the morning cars of the railway at about noon the pont louis philippe was destroyed by fire henceforth it is to be le pont de la réforme and so with all other names royal is to give place to république and libitaire égalité et fraternité is to be again inscribed on all public monuments the children of citizens killed in the revolution were declared adopted by the country the civil judicial and administrative functionaries of the royal government were announced released from their oaths of office the colonels of the twelve legions of national guards were dismissed and all political prisoners set free every citizen was declared an elector and absolute freedom of thought the liberty of the press and the right of political and industrial associations secured to all were proclaimed a warrant for the arrest of the late ministers was issued by the new procureur-general m portali based on an act of accusation presented to the court of appeals but all of them had fled guizot is said to have escaped from the foreign office in a servant's livery when the people broke into his hotel they found only his daughter and retired the other members of the ministry are said to have leaped from a low window of the tuileries and to have escaped at the moment of the king's abdication m de colmenin was appointed conseilleur d'etat and m achille maras procureur general to the court of appeals in paris in place of the refugees such were some of the acts of the seven men constituting the provisional government of the french republic during their first extraordinary session of sixty-four hours from the hour of four o'clock in the afternoon of thursday after the dissolution of the chamber of deputies to the hour of four o'clock in the morning of sunday the twenty seventh of february when the people of paris consented to retire to their homes but during all of this period night and day without intermission every moment was the hotel de ville surrounded by tumultuous masses infuriated by suspicion apprehension and distrust for two whole days and two whole nights armed men incessantly inundated the square the courts and halls of the hotel de ville they insisted on giving to the republic the character the attitude and the emblems of the first revolution they insisted on a republic violent sweeping dictatorial and terrorist in language in gesture and in colour in place of that determined on moderate pacific legal unanimous and constitutional at the peril of their lives the provisional government resisted this demand twenty times during those sixty-four hours was lamartine taken up dragged carried to the doors and windows or to the head of the grand staircase into the courts and the square to hurl down with his eloquence those emblems of terrorism with which it was attempted to dishonour the republic but the vast and infuriated mass refused to listen and drowned his voice in clamour and vociferation at length when well-nigh exhausted in defence of the emblem of a moderate republic he exclaimed the red flag has been nowhere except around the champ de mars trailed in the blood of the people while the tricolour has been around the world with our navy our glory and our liberties the furious and hitherto obdurate and bloodthirsty populace became softened tears were shed arms were lowered flags were thrown away and peaceably they departed to their homes never never was there a more glorious triumph of eloquence of patriotism it was on the morning of sunday the twenty seventh day of february that the provisional government deemed it prudent and proper for them to bring to a close their initiative labours and once more for the last time lamartine descended the steps of the great staircase of the hotel de ville and presenting himself in front of the edifice surrounded by his colleagues announced to the vast assembly the result of their protracted toil royalty abolished 
a republic proclaimed the people restored to their political rights national workshops opened the army and national guard reorganized the abolition of death for political offences with louder and more prolonged acclamations than any other decree was this last received and instantly in accordance with this proclamation the director of criminal affairs on the order of m cremio minister of justice dispatched on the wings of the wind all over france the warrant to suspend all capital executions which were to have taken place in virtue of royal decrees until the will of the national assembly at once to be convened should be promulgated on the subject of the penalty of death the effects of this decree as it sped on the lightning's wings like a saving angel all over france may be imagined perhaps but portrayal is impossible who can imagine even the joy the rapture it brought to many a dungeon prisoner who was counting the hours that yet remained to him of life and preceded his awful doom or to those who sorrowed over his untimely perchance his unjust fate leaning on the arm of louis blanc the youngest member of the government the venerable dupont de lure the eldest accompanied by the other members now appeared on the balcony of the room formerly called the chamber of the throne but now the chamber of the republic lamartine then advanced a step before his colleagues and in a brief and eloquent address proclaimed to that immense throng the existence of the republic the announcement was received with acclamations of joy and shouts of viva le gouvernement viva la martine viva louis blanc mingled with those of viva la republique loudly rose from the hotel de ville the provisional government proceeded in a body despite the rain which fell in torrents accompanied by the people to the place de la bastille there officially to inaugurate the republic agreeably to announcement at the appointed hour the place de la bastille was thronged the national guard consisting of two battalions from each of the twelve legions of paris together with the thirteenth legion of cavalry and two battalions of the banlieue were drawn up from the church of the madeleine to the column of july and there at the base of that column erected in commemoration of the revolution which had made louis philippe king of the french his downfall was commemorated and on the ruins of the throne then established was now inaugurated a republic during the ceremony of the inauguration the marseillaise was sung by the national guard and the people and at its conclusion about the hour of three the troops filed off before the column of july to the thrilling strains of the marseillaise and the mourir pour la patrie of the girondins the members of the provisional government preceded by a detachment of the national guard and accompanied by the pupils of the polytechnic school and the military school of st cyr then descended the boulevards followed by the whole of the military and civic array who chanted the national songs the effect was stupendous hour after hour the immense procession moved on like a huge serpent through the streets of paris and at length when its head was at the hotel de ville its extremity had hardly left the column of july it was night on sunday the twenty seventh of february when the members of the provisional government for the first time during four days returned to their homes but their work was accomplished a republic was gained proclaimed and inaugurated end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty six dantes and mercedes it was a tempestuous night the wind howled dismally through the streets of paris 
and the rain and sleet dashed fiercely against the casements at intervals a wild shout might be caught as the blast paused in its furious career and then a distant shot might be heard but they passed away and nothing save the wail of the storm wind or the rushing sleet of the winter tempest was distinguished but while all was thus wild dark and tempestuous without light warmth comfort and elegance rendered yet more delightful by the elemental war reigned triumphant within a large and splendidly furnished apartment in the noble mansion of m dantes the deputy from marseilles in the rue de elder every embellishment which art could invent luxury court wealth invoke or even imagination conceive seemed there lavished with a most prodigal hand the soft atmosphere of summer perfumed by the exotics of a neighbouring conservatory delighted the senses the mild effulgence of gaslight transmitted through opaque globes of glass melted upon the sight while sofas divans and ottomans in luxurious profusion invited repose to describe the rare paintings the rich gems of statuary and the other miracles of art which were there to be seen would be as impossible as it would be to portray the exquisite taste which enhanced the value of each and constituted more than half its charm upon one of the elegant sofas reclined edmond dantes his tall and graceful figure draped in a dressing robe while beside him on a low ottoman sat his beautiful wife her arm resting on his knee and her dark glorious eyes gazing with confiding fondness into his face mercedes was no longer the young light-hearted and thoughtless being who graced the village of the catalans many years had flown since then and many sorrows passed over her each of these years and each of these sorrows like retiring waves of the sea upon the smooth and sandy beach had left behind its trace no mercedes was not now the young light-hearted and thoughtless girl she once was but she was a being far more perfect far more winning far more to be loved she was a matured impassioned accomplished and still despite the flight of years most lovely woman she was one who could feel passion as well as inspire it and having once felt or inspired it that passion it was plain could never pass lightly away her face could not now boast perhaps that full and perfect oval which it formerly had but the lines of care and of reflection which here and there almost imperceptibly appeared rendered it all the more charming in the bold yet beautiful contour of those features in the full red lips in the high pale forehead and above all in those dark and haunting eyes lay a depth of feeling and profundity and nobleness of thought which to a reflective mind have a charm infinitely more irresistible than that which belongs to mere youthful perfection there was a bland beauty in the smile which slept upon her lips a delicacy of sentiment in the faint flush that tinged her soft cheek and a deep meaning in her dark and eloquent eye which told a whole history of experience even to a stranger while the full and rounded outline of the figure garbed in a loose robe of crimson which contrasted beautifully with her luxuriant dark tresses had that voluptuous development and grace which only maturity and maternity can impart to the female form in short never had mercedes in the days of her primal bloom presented a person so fascinating as now she was a woman to sigh for perchance to die for and one whom a man would willingly wish to live for if he might but hope she would live for him or peradventure he might even be willing not only to risk but ultimately to resign his life would that fair being not only live for him but love him with that entire and passionate devotedness which beamed from her dark eyes up into his who now gazed upon her as she sat at his feet as for him as for edmond dantes 
his figure had now the same elegance his hand the same delicate whiteness his features the same spiritual beauty his brow the same marble pallor and his eye which beamed beneath its calm expanse the same deep brilliancy which years before had distinguished him from all other men and made the count of monte cristo the idol of every salon in paris and the hero of every maiden's dream yet that face was not without its changes tears care thought and sorrow had done their work in the deep lines upon his brow and cheek in the silvery threads which thickly sprinkled his night-black hair and more than all in the mild light of those eyes which once glowed only with vindictive hate or gratified revenge and in the softened expression of those lips which once in their stern beauty had but curled with scorn or quivered with rage could be read that the lapse of time though it might indeed have made him a sadder man had made him also a better one the husband and wife were alone they still loved as warmly as ever and if possible more fondly than when first they were made one dantes stretched himself out on the sofa and mercedes dropping lower upon the low ottoman at his side passed her full and beautiful arm around his waist and pressed her lips to his forehead he returned the embrace with warmth and placing his own arm about her form drew it closely to his bosom thus they remained clasped in each other's arms and thus they fixed on each other eyes beaming with love passion bliss happiness unutterable my own edmund murmured mercedes at length you are again with me all my own am i not always your own dearest was the fond reply but during the week past i might almost say during the month past you have been compelled to be so often absent from me ah love you know i was not willingly absent was the quick answer no 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 but it was hardly the more endurable for that said the lady with a smile oh the anxiety of the last three days and nights dearest i do believe i have not slept three hours during the whole of those three days and nights and i dear have slept not one was the laughing rejounder but all is over now is it not in one sense all is over and in another all now begins the monarchy is ended in france i believe for ever the republic has begun and i trust will prove lasting and all the grand objects for which you have been striving with your noble colleagues for years and years are at length accomplished are they not that is a question love not easily answered that the cause of man and france has wonderfully triumphed during the past three days is no doubt most true but this victory love i foresaw indeed it was but the inevitable result of an irresistible cause it was neither chance love nor a spontaneous burst of patriotism that on the first day filled the boulevards with fifty thousand blouses which on the second won over to the people eighty thousand national guards and on the third choked the streets of paris with barricades constructed by engineers and defended by men completely armed the events of the last three days mercedes have been maturing in the womb of providence for the past ten years it is their birth only which has now taken place and to some the parturition seems a little premature i suppose this banquet caused the fright that hastened the event added dantes laughing you are very scientific in your comparisons replied mercedes slightly blushing and i suppose i must admit very apt but tell me love is all over that is must you be away from me any more at night and wander about heaven only knows where in this dark and dangerous city or heaven only knows with whom or for what dantes kissed his fair wife and after a pause during which he gazed fondly into her eyes replied i hope i trust i believe dear that all is over at least all that will take me from you as during the past week france has or will have a republic that is as certain as fate can make it 
but first she will have to pass through strife and tribulation perhaps bloodshed the end surely love is not yet but france is now comparatively free the dreadful problem is now nearer solution than it ever was labor will hereafter be granted to all together with the adequate reward of labor destitution will not be deemed guilt the death penalty is abolished the rich will not with impunity grind the poor into powder beneath their heels asylums for the suffering the distressed the abandoned of both sexes will be sustained the efforts which as individuals we have some of us made for years to ameliorate the condition of mankind to assuage human woes and augment human joys will henceforth be encouraged and directly aided by the state this revolution love is a social revolution and during the sixty-four hours the provisional government was in session in the hotel de ville i became thoroughly convinced that the thousands and tens of thousands who with sleepless vigilance watched their proceedings had learned the deep lesson too well to be further deceived and that the fruits of the revolution they had won would not again be snatched from their lips and the result of this triumph of the people you believe has advanced the cause of human happiness asked mercedes most unquestionably dear and most incalculably too perhaps all your friends are not as disinterested as you have been edmund said mercedes and why think you that dear for six full years i know you have devoted all your powers of mind and body and all your immense wealth to one single object and that object has been the happiness of your race well dear and now when a triumph has been achieved now when others who have been but mere instruments blind instruments many of them in your hands to accomplish they knew not what come forward and assume place and power you edmund the noble author and first cause of all remain quietly in seclusion unknown unnamed unappreciated and uncommended while the others reap the fruits of your toil well dear said dantes smiling at the warmth of his wife in his behalf but it is not well edmund i say no one is as disinterested as you ah love what of ambition mercedes smiled let me tell you all love and then you will not i fear think me disinterested said dantes seriously i should blush indeed at praise so little deserved you know all my early history i suffered i was wronged i was revenged but was i happy i sought happiness all men do so even the most miserable some seek happiness in gratified ambition some in gratified avarice some in gratified vanity and some in the gratification of a dominant lust for pleasure or for power i sought happiness in gratified revenge mercedes shuddered and hiding her face on the bosom of her husband clung to it more closely as if for protection dantes drew her form to his as he would have drawn that of a child and continued i sought happiness in vengeance for terrible wrongs and to win it i devoted a life and countless wealth what was the result misery 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 poor edmund murmured mercedes clinging to him closer than ever at length i awoke as from a dream i saw my error my whole life had been a lie i saw that god by a miracle had bestowed on me untold riches for a nobler purpose than to make his creatures wretched i saw that if i would be happy i must make others happy and to this end the happiness not the misery of my race must my wealth and power be devoted to this end then did i devote myself and to this end for six years have i been devoted to make myself happy by making others happy you among the rest dear dear mercedes he added pressing her to his bosom and am i then so disinterested but why should you achieve triumphs for others to enjoy edmund asked the wife you refer to the provisional government said dantes with a smile well i see i must tell you all even though by the revelation i prove myself utterly unworthy of the praise of disinterestedness 
i may tell you love you my second self without danger of being charged with egotism what i might not say to others our friend lamartine is the actual head of this government i had but to assent to the urgent entreaties to secure that position for myself these appointments seem the result of nomination by the people yet they are not and why did you refuse to head the government edmund i am ashamed to confess to you that i feared to accept said dantes after a pause my own selfishness not alas my disinterestedness has kept me from the post of peril perhaps indeed i can do far more for the cause of my race as i am than i could by sacrificing myself for office and position at least i hope so is the position of your friends then so perilous asked mercedes dearest they stand upon a volcano said dantes solemnly ha cried the lady in alarm mercedes mercedes continued dantes with enthusiasm i sometimes am startled with the idea that to me have been entrusted the awful powers of foreknowledge of prophecy so fearfully true have some of my predictions proved the events of the past week i foresaw and foretold even to minute circumstances and the hours of their occurrence and now glorious as is the triumph that france and the cause of man have achieved i perceive in the dim future a sea of commotion all is not yet settled within one month revolution will succeed revolution throughout europe berlin vienna and madrid perhaps also st petersburg london and all the cities of italy will be in revolt all europe must and will feel the events of the past week in paris europe must be free and our friends lamartine louis blanc within six months louis blanc will be in exile and lamartine he may be in a dungeon or on a scaffold ah exclaimed mercedes clinging yet more closely to her husband but the cause of human happiness human right and human freedom will live for ever that must be will be eternal as eternal my adored mercedes as is our own deathless love end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty seven esperance and zuleika during the whole period of the memorable revolution zuleika never once saw her brother though she was burning with a desire to have an interview with him on the subject that had caused the separation between her young italian lover and herself esperance made his home behind the barricades from the time the struggle began until the people finally triumphed gun in hand he fought as heroically as the most devoted workman fearlessly exposing himself whenever the troops pressed his comrades in arms and always in the thick of the fight begrimed with dust and powder his garments torn by bullets and bayonet thrusts his hat battered and rent he encouraged the people by word and example constantly shouting viva la republique and contending for liberty with the bravery of a lion and a persistency that never flagged he however escaped without a single scratch returning to the paternal mansion utterly worn out but altogether unhurt proud of having done his duty as a man and a patriot and of having sustained the glorious cause for which his father was working heart and soul as he was slowly and wearily wending his way homeward he suddenly encountered m dantes and his friend lamartine in the rue richelieu his gun was on his shoulder and in his tattered attire with the dust and powder on his face and hands he had the exact appearance of an insurrectionist and a barricader he touched his hat in military fashion to m dantes and his illustrious companion and was about passing on when his father recognized him and ragged and begrimed as he was threw his arms enthusiastically about his neck 
m lamartine watched the deputy from marseilles and could not restrain an expression of astonishment at his singular behaviour m dantes smiled and taking esperance by the hand said m lamartine you will i know make every allowance for me when you learn that this young man who has been fighting behind the barricades with the people is my son the head of the provisional government instantly grew as enthusiastic as mr dantes himself he grasped esperance's free hand and shaking it with the utmost cordiality exclaimed your son monsieur dantes let me congratulate you why he is a perfect hero i have but followed my father's teachings and done what he would have done had he been my age and unable to serve the great cause of human freedom in a more effective way m dantes eyes sparkled with joy and a faint shade of colour appeared upon his pale cheeks what is your name young patriot asked m lamartine his excitement and enthusiasm continuing to hold possession of him esperance was the reply esperance hope the name is both appropriate and auspicious with such heroic young men as you fighting for our cause there is indeed hope and of the brightest and best kind cried lamartine nay nay said m dantes do not flatter the boy he has but done his duty believe me i do not flatter him returned lamartine i have simply told him the truth in time he will rival the devotion and achievements of his noble father enough enough said the deputy modestly we deserve only the credit of executing god's will we are merely instruments in his omnipotent hand he added impressively and such instruments are exactly what we need in the present crisis god grant us plenty of them the next morning zuleika encountered esperance on the stairway she led him into the salon and when they were seated said my brother i have a question to ask of you a shadow crossed the young man's brow and he quickly asked is it about the viscount massetti yes then i must refuse to answer but the matter concerns my happiness nay my very life itself think of that before you finally refuse to answer my question esperance hastily and excitedly arose from his chair and stood in front of his sister zuleika said he in an agitated tone beware of that man beware of giovanni massetti beware of giovanni esperance and why the young man began to pace the salon with short and nervous steps his hands twitched convulsively and his face had suddenly assumed the whiteness of chalk zuleika zuleika he murmured i cannot i cannot tell you why it would crash you to the very earth and make you blush with shame that you had ever listened to the seductive tones of that doubly false italian's voice but esperance said zuleika papa certainly knows all about giovanni if he did not altogether approve of his character and conduct he would never have consented to admit him as a suitor for my hand a suitor for your hand zuleika my god has he then dared he has done nothing that an upright and honourable man should not do interrupted zuleika warmly he did not even call here until he had written to papa and obtained his full permission to do so zuleika said esperance approaching his sister and taking her hand no doubt giovanni massetti has conducted himself in all respects toward you like a perfect gentleman but nevertheless he is not fit to be my sister's husband but papa has been deceived as have many others in regard to the true character and standing of this so-called roman nobleman and is he not a nobleman once more i must refuse to answer any question in regard to him i can only tell you to beware and shun him as you would a venomous serpent esperance i love him love him you love him zuleika oh this is indeed torture the young man dropped his sister's hand and flung himself upon a divan he was a prey to the most intense excitement zuleika deeply affected to see him thus and remembering giovanni's mysterious behaviour together with his strange and ominous words when she had questioned him in regard to his quarrel with esperance felt for a moment shaken and uncertain she also recollected that at the time of the inexplicable difficulty between the two young men she had heard rumours to the effect that a youthful member of the roman aristocracy had abducted a beautiful peasant girl in which affair he had been assisted by the notorious brigand luigi vampa 
the matter however had almost immediately been hushed up and she had learned none of the circumstances could it be possible that giovanni massetti was the youthful aristocrat alluded to by the gossips and scandal-mongers of the eternal city that he was the abductor of the unfortunate peasant girl she could not entertain such an idea and yet that abduction in spite of all her efforts would associate itself with her italian lover in her mind she arose from her chair and going to the divan seated herself beside esperance determined to make a final attempt to draw his secret from him throwing her arms tenderly about his neck she said in a coaxing tone if any sound reason exists why i should not love giovanni massetti and you know it your plain duty as my brother is to tell me will you not tell me esperance instead of replying the young man buried his face in his hands and fairly sobbed in his anguish zuleika was filled with pity for him and as she gazed at him tears came into her eyes but still bent on discovering the nature of the obstacle that had so suddenly loomed up between giovanni and herself she continued after a pause in the same coaxing voice esperance i am no longer a child and should not be treated as one what i ask of you is only reasonable and just if i stand on the brink of a gulf i cannot see it is your duty to inform me not only of my danger but also of its nature am i not right heaving a deep sigh esperance replied yes you are right zuleika it is my duty to tell you all and yet i cannot at least tell me why you are compelled to maintain silence on a matter of so much importance did you question the viscount i did and what answer did he return like you he refused to answer ah then he has some sense of shame left shame yes shame and what did you do when he refused to speak i left him and you will not see him again not until he has decided to tell me all then you will never put eyes upon him more he dare not tell you dare not and why because did you know the depth of his infamy you would spurn him from you suddenly a grave suspicion stole into zuleika's mind and made her tremble from head to foot might it not be that esperance had been as deeply involved in the mysterious and infamous affair of which he declined to speak as giovanni massetti himself the thought was torment and totally unable to restrain her keen anxiety to be instantly informed upon this topic zuleika gasped out were you not esperance as guilty as your former friend the young man leaped to his feet as if a tarantula had bitten him no no cried he i was innocent of all blame in the matter luigi vampa he abruptly checked himself and stood staring at his sister as if in dismay at having unguardedly uttered the brigand's name but zuleika said nothing giovanni massetti also had protested his innocence and the young girl knew not what to believe luigi vampa so then he had been a party to this mysterious and terrible business whatever it was and again she thought of the abduction of the beautiful peasant girl could that be the fearful secret yes it must be luigi vampa had assisted in that abduction if report could be relied on and the chief criminal had been a youthful member of the roman aristocracy oh it was all plain now zuleika shuddered and felt her heart grow heavy as lead while a sharp killing pang ran through it had esperance been misled by vampa and the viscount had he discovered too late the infamy of the affair and challenged massetti on that account this was doubtless the solution of the whole enigma and yet zuleika hesitated to accept it as such no no she could not accept it without further and more convincing proof but how was that proof to be obtained neither the viscount nor her brother would speak it was evident that their lips were sealed possibly an oath to maintain silence had been extorted from them under terrible circumstances an oath they feared to break even to clear themselves from a foul suspicion but vampa he might perhaps be induced to give the key to the mystery vampa however was far away in rome and inaccessible 
zuleika made a wild resolve she would write to the brigand and throw herself upon his generosity then she decided that the plan was impracticable her letter would never reach vampa it would be seized by the roman authorities and might cause additional trouble by reviving a smothered scandal and even should it reach the brigand would he answer it the chances were a hundred to one that he would not at this instant an inspiration came to the tortured girl like a flash of lightning her father had known vampa in the past and perhaps still possessed some influence over him she had heard the story of albert de morcerf's adventure in the catacombs of saint sebastian and was aware that the brigand chief had released him from captivity without ransom at her father's simple solicitation would not vampa answer her questions if m dantes could be influenced to write him and ask them she had full faith in her father's power to get a letter to the bandit notwithstanding all the vigilance of the roman authorities yes she would go to him tell all her suspicions without reserve and beg him to write the letter it was hardly likely he would refuse he could not he must not thus resolved zuleika looked her brother full in the face and said calmly i see i torture you with my questions esperance that for some reason best known to yourself you cannot answer them and that it is useless to torment you further but something must be done and that at once i am going to my father esperance caught her wildly by the arm you are mad cried he it is you who are mad you and giovanni i tell you i am going to my father if you are innocent you have nothing to fear from any revelation i may make with these words she freed herself from her brother's grasp and quitted the salon leaving esperance standing in the centre of the apartment as if he were rooted to the spot End of section twenty nine